We are going to finish up our series today called What's Love Got to Do With It? And uh, it's been a series on love and relationships. It is based off the Tina Turner song from 1984. Um, but it is, the name of the series is a play on words. While we are talking about love and relationships, what we are actually talking about is what God has to say about our relationships. Because John tells us in 1 John 4, 16, that God is love. So what's love got to do with it? We're really saying what has God got to do with our relationships? We talked about how marriages take work last week, but if you center your marriage on Christ, he will help you put in the work and stay committed through thick and thin. Today I want to finish up this series by talking about three more keys to having a healthy marriage, which are compassion, communication, and confidence. This is a point that we've kind of talked about, but I've never really put it into words like this. But I want you to know, first of all, that marriage is a sacred institution where two people become one. One male, one female, as it's ordained in Genesis. The first part of this definition, though, is I want to point out that it's sacred. Our secular world has tried to hijack the idea of what marriage is. The Supreme Court believes they can define a marriage. They can't. Marriage is a sacred institution that God created. In fact, when Jesus is addressing marriage in Matthew chapter 19, verses 4 through 5, he takes us back to the beginning with the Creator, God, who made them male and female. And he said, for this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife. There is no level of uh, wiggle room in that statement. Amen. A man shall leave his father and mother and be united to his wife, period, and the two will become one flesh. One of the first things God instituted from the beginning was the concept of marriage. This is something that God came up with, that God created. And when those two people leave their, their parents, they become one flesh. It's two people with different backgrounds, different struggles both in the past and present, and different personalities who are called to form one united marriage. You've probably been to a wedding. How many of you have been to a wedding where they use the sand ceremony as the example? Yes. People? Yeah? Sand ceremony? It's where you take two... I was going to explain it for you anyway, Randy, because I know you. Uh, uh, is where they take two different colors of sand and they pour it into one vase. And so anytime I've done the sand ceremony or seen another pastor do the sand ceremony, they talk about how you notice that they still stay two unique colors, but they begin to mix and intertwine. And they're in one vase, one united uh, part. The two stay unique, though. And it's, it's a good example of marriage because even though you have become one flesh, in the spiritual realm you have become one, that doesn't mean that you're both the same. Some of you have found that out. <laughs> you're going to get in trouble, Dennis. Just hit him, Sandy. Hit him, Sandy. That means you bring different backgrounds, different struggles, both past and present. And different personalities. You have different ways of dealing with things. But you're called to bring it all together. And are united for the rest of your earthly life. And because you're two unique people that are called to become one, staying in a marriage is hard. Because of that dynamic that is at work. So let's talk about how to effectively bring two unique people together to form one united marriage. And today we're going to continue to look at the life of Jacob. Jacob has fled from his home at this point after he stole his brother's blessing. And he's going to try to find a wife. Last week we saw he worked seven years for the love of his life named Rachel. And he ended up getting Leah. And I want to call her Leah, like Princess Leah, but Leah. Now he's working another seven years for Rachel. He's married to both Rachel and Leah. And as I said last week... We do not want to learn from that. 
And you're about to see why today. Look at the woman drama that is about to take place because he's married to two people. I can say confidently one woman and all the drama, I mean blessings, <laughs> that come from her is enough. Good thing my wife is holding our baby so she can't come up here and hit me right now. Our sleeping baby. That's right. My first point for you is this, and you've done heard it, but healthy marriages take compassion. Healthy marriages take compassion. We were told last week, we left off right here, Genesis 29, 30, where Jacob made love to Rachel, and his love for Rachel was greater than his love for Leah. Now, you better believe that Leah was very aware of that. And in fact, the Lord was aware of that. And we're told here in verse 31, the Lord saw that Leah was not loved. And so what the Lord enabled her to do was to conceive. But Rachel remained childless. And so Leah became pregnant and gave birth to a son. She named him Reuben. For she said, it is because the Lord has seen my misery, surely my husband will love me now. That last statement there breaks my heart. That she does not feel loved by her husband. In fact, we have it confirmed from the Lord that she is not loved by her husband. And she is clearly struggling with this, understanding that she is second fiddle in this relationship hierarchy. And she's struggling with that as any of us would. We talked about in the first week that women feel loved when a man actually cares about them and is even going as far as willing to lay down their life for them. But I think Leah knows here that if it came down between Rachel and her, he's speaking Rachel all day long. This is when Jacob could be a better husband. And he could have some compassion on her. Because the truth is, she probably was not all that interested in Jacob anyway. She was forced into this marriage by her father. That's how they came together. And so what she's doing is she's just trying to deal with the present circumstances to the best of her ability and needs her spouse to step in and have some compassion on her and help her as she's struggling. And if you're like me and Sarah, we've been in that same spot where we need our spouse to show some compassion for us. Compassion means sympathy or concern. I heard Sandy say patience. It goes along with it. She says that because she's married to Dennis. <laughs> Compassion means to show sympathy or concern, and it means that someone is willing to show mercy and grace and forgiveness for someone else. And you know, for me personally, I especially need compassion from others when I'm struggling with something. In some cases, it might be the current things that me or you are struggling with, like anxiety and depression or maybe struggles at work. When I start to struggle with this type of stuff, I can get short, I can get cranky. Most of the time, I get quiet, which drives Sarah crazy. And I'm just not an overall joy to be around. In those cases, I need Sarah to show me some compassion, to have some sympathy for me because of what I'm dealing with outside of our marriage. In other cases, maybe some people are dealing with things from their past that still affect them in the present. I've seen this be especially true when someone has been abused in past relationships. There are triggers from their current spouse, even though their current spouse might be great, there are triggers that can happen based off what their spouse says or their spouse does that take them back to past things that have happened. And in those cases, the spouse needs to show compassion for them to ensure that they do not hit one of their triggers. And then finally, there are sometimes just straight up personality differences between couples. You've heard opposites attract, and that is, that is pretty true. One of the biggest things I've seen is the introvert versus extrovert personality differences some of us like to be by ourselves. some of us do not like being by ourselves. during the summer 
uh, share example. During the summer, Sarah's off of school, and she is home all the time. And now we have a church office for that very reason. Not really. Uh, Sarah knows that I need time to myself. I will get worn out if I always have someone talking in my ear. I will get worn out if I have to be around people, and that's including my wife. I need one-on-one -on -one time with God. I need time by myself to recharge. Sarah knows that, so what Sarah will do intentionally during the summer, this is showing compassion to me. Would she rather be around me? Yes, who wouldn't? Um, <laughs> but what she would really rather do it, well, what she actually does is she will leave. She'll go to her parents' house, she'll go swimming, she'll go shopping, whatever it is, and let me have me time. I appreciate that so much. Especially when we did not have a church office here, did not have a place for me to work. I appreciated that a lot because she is showing compassion to me, who is an introvert who needs that time. And she'll straight up say, you need rest, don't you? I'll go to my parents. And, and I thank her for that. That's her showing compassion, meeting me where I'm at. And often I see there's personality difference in, in terms of way people deal with bad things that happen, or especially parenting, but bad things that happen, like maybe when something bad happens, one spouse needs quiet time in order to process it, but the other one needs to talk about it. You've got to show compassion to the other one and however they process things. But the truth is we all need compassion. We all struggle. And we have a God who has set the example for us on how to show compassion. And I'm so grateful for that. Psalm 86, 15 says, But you, Lord, are a compassionate and gracious God, slow to anger, abounding in love and faithfulness. God shows us sympathy and concern even when we don't deserve it. And we should be thankful for that. When I'm talking about showing compassion, I want to go through three things here. And it kind of goes off of that verse there. First, one of the best ways to be compassionate to your spouse is to be kind to your spouse at all times. There is a right way and there is a wrong way to say things. I am in no way saying you cannot say what's on your mind, but I'm saying you can do it in a nice, compassionate way. God is slow to anger, and we should strive to be slow to anger as well. When we get angry, we say things that we don't mean. When we get angry, we say things that maybe we're really thinking, but we say them in such a way that only escalates the situation to where it's worse. There is a nice way, and there's a not-so-nice way to say things, and I've seen couples fight that the whole fight could have been avoided if it was said differently. Not what was said, but how it was said. But it was said that way because of anger. Don't let anger control you. Be kind to one another. The next thing we see here is that he's abounding in love and faithfulness. And in Ephesians 4.32, we're told to be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other just as in Christ God he forgave you. Second way to be compassionate is to forgive. Forgive your spouse. Sometimes they're not going to be very nice to you. But you got to look past that. You got to forgive them for that. Sarah and I do not fight very often. Um, that's just not ever really been a part of our relationship. There are times, though, where I can sense that the temperature in the marriage is going up. And it, it, it has happened a lot more since we've had a baby where we're disagreeing maybe on what needs to be done with Elijah. And I'm still a little hard-headed, so I've not learned what every man has told me, that the correct answer is yes, dear. Look at, <laughs> looking at you, Dennis. Um, but Sarah and I have had to quickly, don't be slow to forgive in your spouse. Quickly forgive your spouse. Because if not, it will fester. If not, it will turn into something bigger. And so something we, we, I think we both are intentional about doing is when we sense that temperature going up, I think we immediately forgive one another and the temperature comes right back down. I think that's why we don't fight very often. Because, uh, you know, if, if, if I am angry about something, I normally get quiet. And she can know that. And a lot of times we just let it sit for a little while and then we discuss it. 
there's times where the door gets slammed or um, I, when she gets angry, she gets red in the face, in the neck. And, I mean, she does that when she gets angry, when she gets sad, when anything. Um, that's one good thing about redheads is you can tell what they're feeling. Um, and I can tell, and, and, and especially when it's something that's said ugly or something that is um, um, done, it's immediate forgiveness from one another so it does not become something bigger. And that's what we should all strive to do. And then finally, the last way to show compassion is just simply to love. And when we talk about love, I talk about truth and grace. Does it mean you don't tell them the truth about how you feel in it? You tell them the truth, even if it leads to conflict. And we'll get to that later in the sermon. But you do it gracefully, as God has done it gracefully to us. In other words, Jesus told us this, and I think this is a good way for you to deal with your spouse. Do to others as you would have them to do to you. Do to your spouse as you would have them do to you. How do you want to be treated? That's how you better treat them. Second point is this. Healthy marriage takes communication. So in Genesis 29, (coughs) 33 through 34, (coughs) Leah conceived again, and when she gave birth to a son, she said, because the Lord has heard that I am not love, he gave me this one too, so she named him Simeon. Again, she conceived. And when she gave birth to a son, she said, Now, now at last my husband will become attached to me because I have borne him three sons. So he was named Levi. Now this is me. I want to make clear, this is me. This is not scripture. But I am thankful that when we read these stories, these are real people that had real feelings and real relationships and they really lived on this earth like me and you. And I think, And I think anybody that has children can go with this. There is no way Jacob couldn't have loved her, at least some, after giving him his first son. We are all humans. And there's a special connection you have with someone who you had a child with. No matter what happens, I think there is some level where you still love them. It might be deep down in there, but you still love them. And in this case, the marriage relationship is still going on, and he might as well make it work if he's in the relationship. I think here, Jacob is not communicating with her that she is loved. Hey, you're the mother of my child. You're the mother of three of my children at this point. And that's not including maybe any any girls that were born that just didn't get recorded. You're the mother of my children. I desire, I, I love you for that. I, mean, I, I might be wrong on this, but I mean, my love for Sarah grew after we had a child. I've talked to others that have talked about, yes, you know, things have changed in the marriage, but guess what? That is still the mother or father of my children, and I still love them on a certain level. But most marriages, most marriage problems all go back to communication. And I've seen like three different levels of that. Um, one, I've seen marriages where there's just no communication at all, where you're just supposed to know what the other one's feeling. You're just supposed to know what the other one wants. You're just supposed to know everything about the other person. And uh, it, when those needs and those wants are not met, it creates a fight and it creates problems in the relationship and so on and so forth. But there's no communication before the fight. It's just right into the fight. That's not healthy. That's not a marriage. That's not a relationship. I've also seen, though, marriages where there's misleading communication. And what I mean by that is where you only talk about what is good and not maybe what some of your problems are, what is bad. Where you keep to just that, that the, the part where you want to avoid conflict at all costs. That is no way to live in a marriage. Healthy communication is going to involve both sides talking about what they really are feeling and thinking and hearing each side out. I've seen marriages have no communication, misleading communication, and the third one was healthy communication. We should have healthy communication with our spouses. And healthy communication, contrary to popular opinion, actually involves conflict. Conflict is healthy. 
Now, yelling at each other and circling the table and hitting things and throwing things, that is not healthy. But conflict, when two people disagree, conflict is healthy because you often reach this mutual solution. But this goes back to the be compassionate point. Be kind to one another. Don't let your anger take control. Work with one another to find a mutual solution because what I've seen in marriages, going back to the misleading communication where you only talk about the good and not the bad, what happens is because you're not talking about the bad, then things start bubbling up within you. And eventually, once your spouse continues to do things wrong that you don't like, it becomes this volcanic eruption where everything comes out at one time where you're complaining about everything from something that happened five years ago that you never talked about to something that happened just then. And it becomes this explosion where all that anger, all that conflict that you've been avoiding is coming out in one big fight. That's not healthy either because you say things when your emotions take control that you don't mean. Conflict is going to happen in any marriage because you are two unique people trying to build one life together healthy communication also builds your connection you learn about what's going on in each other's heads and you learn about what is going on in each other's lives and you're able to then change your actions to meet what is going on in their life something that pretty much happens every day is sarah comes home and she tells me about her work day and i tell her about what has gone on um what has gone on in the church world or in my world and sometimes it's as simple as me and Elijah took three naps today and sometimes it's I've been on the phone for the last five hours unfortunately this past week it's been the second but we talk to one another and guess what that builds our connection with one another to have healthy communication one of the things you have to do is actively listen men We have been given the spiritual gift where we can tune our our wives out. I call it a spiritual gift anyway. That's not how you actively listen. (laughs) That is not a gift that we should be using. What we should instead strive to do is actively listen to our spouse. And when I say actively listen, I mean you are actually responding to your spouse. You're having an open, honest conversation with them. And you take away the distractions that are in the room. Turn off the TV, turn off all this other stuff, and just talk. Some of mine and Sarah's best talks come right before bed because there's nothing on. We're just talking to one another. Sharing about what each other's feeling, what each other's going through. Um, Some of our best talks happen at night as we're going to bed. Um, And I think men, honestly, we have to be very intentional about this. Because sometimes, uh, they've seen me come in here on Friday nights before, and my eyes are real big, and it's like, I just got told a bunch of stuff that I don't understand, because I'm not a teacher. And so we got, they're talking about uh, 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 anchor charts. I, when I, I hear anchor charts, I think of an anchor with a chart attached to the top of it. And I don't think that's what it looks like, probably. And we're talking about all these acronyms that I don't understand. And uh, Sarah knows it's going in one ear and out the other because I don't understand. And I, I, I've, come, I've come here on Friday nights or some other time, and I told Bernard, I said, she talked my ears off the whole way here. And I don't have a clue what was said. Uh, and she catches me in that sometime. We've well, got to be careful not to do that. Just to be honest with you, we've got to be careful not to do that on both sides. Healthy communication also takes transparency. Be open with one another. This happens in any relationship, friendships, relationships, any relationship. If you are open with the other person, guess what? They will be more willing to be open with you. That's one of the things I appreciate about our recovery group on Monday. There's been this culture built where you can be transparent with one another and you don't feel like you can't be because you already know what a sinner David Whitman is. So, so you can be honest about what's going on in your life. Right, David? Be transparent with one another, and that's especially important in the marriage. Talk about your struggles. Talk about what's going on in your mind. And then finally, healthy communication takes you being intentional. It doesn't just happen. 
be intentional about talking each day, and I would encourage it to be a part of your routine around a certain time of day each day. I've encouraged some couples to do what's called highs and lows. At the end of the day, you talk about the good thing that happened in your day and the, and the bad thing, the low thing that happened in your day. And what that does is helps your spouse to see both ends of the equation. Hey, this was something they liked. This was something they didn't like. And um, you can maybe help them with the low or celebrate with them on the high. There is no communication. Your marriage or any relationship will not work. That's just the truth of it. And finally, the last point is this, and this is going to take some explanation. Healthy marriages take confidence. And not confidence in yourself. And I'll get to that. Leah, she conceived again. But this time it's different. When she gave birth to a son, she said, this time I will praise the Lord. And she named him Judah. And then she stopped having children. Look at the shift that happens here. She has went from focusing on having kids in order to earn her husband's love, in order to get him to love her. But this child, this child's different. This child, her response is that she is going to praise the Lord. There is nothing about her husband in this, in this verse right here because her focus has changed. Her focus has shifted. She names him Judah, which means praise. And so she's saying she will praise the Lord as a result of this one. And when we're just reading through the scriptures and reading this as a biography or something that happened, we miss what a big change this is for her in her life. No longer is she trying to earn her husband's love because what has happened now is her focus has turned to God. And I think that what is happening here is that she has become secure in the love that God has for her. And so her only response when she's having this child is that I'm going to praise God. No matter what my husband does, no matter if my husband loves me or not, I'm thankful for the blessings God has given me. And I'm going to praise the Lord for all that he's done. That's a shift that needs to happen in our marriages as well. Your spouse is important to you. They should be, but your spouse should not be the most important person to you. Your marriage should not be the most important relationship you have in your life. The most important relationship in your life is your, your relationship with Jesus, period. And if that relationship isn't right, guess what? None of your other relationships will be right either. Let me show you why. Leah, she's made Jacob at, up to this point before this verse. She has made Jacob in his love, I think, an idol. That's what she's chasing after. That's what the verses have been about. She's chasing after this love that Jacob's not showing her. And she's literally having babies to try to earn Jacob's love. If she's having babies to earn Jacob's love, imagine what else she is doing to try to earn Jacob's love. She's probably basically being a slave, hand and foot, doing everything she can to try to make Jacob love her. Because having babies isn't easy. And if she's willing to go that far, imagine what else she was willing to do. I think that in some ways her relationship with Jacob has become a job. And she's chasing after Jacob's love because it's the most important thing for her at that point. And her life was always pointing in that direction. And I guarantee you she was worn out. Because when your marriage becomes like a job, that's, not what, it, that's what, not what it was ever meant to be. But it can happen in our marriages too. Especially when... Our, the hierarchy of our relationships are, is not right. If your spouse is the most important person and the most important relationship you have, I see two things that can happen. One, you can get so focused on earning their love all the time to the point that marriage becomes a job for you too. That you feel like you have to constantly do in order to receive that you constantly have to measure up in order to receive love. And that's exhausting. I've not been in a marriage that way, 
our marriage is not like that. But I have been in friendships and relationships like that. And it's exhausting. When you constantly feel like you have to be perfect in order for your spouse to love you. Second way, though, I've seen this play out is that you become so reliant on your spouse showing you love the way you want to be shown love that your emotional state is so affected when they do not do what you want them to do. What happens then is that puts so much pressure on your spouse and it becomes a job for your spouse. Knowing that if they are not perfect, knowing that if they don't, knowing that they can't rock the boat because if they rock the boat, they don't do everything, if they don't measure up to your expectations, you're going to go down this this bad path and the marriage is going to suffer at least for a few days when your emotional state is tied to your spouse's actions or inaction that's a sign you're in an unhealthy marriage they've become too much of a part of your life and neither of these options are healthy for you or your spouse and so the solution to it is this and this is where the confident piece comes in the solution is to make sure you are confident in your relationship with God. First, understand that you don't have to earn God's love because he loves you the most he ever will right now. His love is constant. His love never changes. No matter what you do or don't do, he still loves you as much as he did before you were created. He loves you as much as, as he ever will, no matter what happens. And his desire is that you'll love him in return, and we'll get to that in a second. But second, I want you to always understand that God's love is sufficient for you. You don't have to have a spouse in order to live a good life here on earth. Paul is an example of that. Paul called it a gift of singleness. Paul had the gift of singleness because he had all the love he needed with God. So even though he could be beaten up, even though he could be in jail, even though he could be mistreated, he was content in every circumstance. Why? Because he had a relationship with God. And he knew God's love for him. God's love will provide you with everything you need. You don't need a spouse to live the life God has for you. Because God's love is enough. And if you know that God's love is enough, and that you don't have to earn God's love, then you're secure and confident in that relationship, and any other relationship you have here on earth is just a cherry on top. Because if you have God, you have everything you need. Because God is at work in you. So my question for you today is this. Are you confident in your relationship with Jesus? And another question I have for you is this, is Jesus first in your life? Or have you been relying too much on other relationships? And if you have been relying too much on other relationships, then are you here today feeling empty and alone inside? Are you here today feeling like you're operating with a deficit? Because you're not receiving everything you need from your spouse or from any other relationship. There's a solution to this, and it's this. And this is your action piece as a response today. Make your relationship with Jesus the most important relationship in your life. Make your relationship with Jesus the most important relationship in your life. Be confident and secure in that relationship and when you are confident and secure in that relationship then you are going to receive the love and i'll even say bask in the love that god has for you just rest in it don't look for love anywhere else this goes for everyone this point right here goes for the singles in the room those who are dating in the room those who are married those who are widowed make jesus your relationship with Jesus, the most important relationship in your life. And if you do, everything else will work out from there. If you do, 
you will see God move and work. In fact, it is imperative that you make your relationship with Jesus the most important relationship in your life because Jesus, God, we're told right here, this is the verse we've been using, that God is love. And the verses before that says, Dear friends, let us love one another for love comes from God. So what John is saying there is that if you want to love one another, then guess what? You've got to understand that love comes from God. And everyone who loves has been born of God and knows God. And whoever does not love does not know God because God is love. John, he's not giving marriage advice here. He's giving advice to all the world. That if you really want to love the way that God has called us to love, then you have to know God. And God has to be the most important relationship you have so that every relationship underneath there is going to experience the love that God is, sh is showing through you. We don't understand that sometimes. We try to show love out of our own power, out of our own strength. But if we want to have healthy relationships then it is imperative that we know the one who is love. It's important that we know and we focus on the one who is love. And here's the thing. Leah, she got it right with Judah. And his line, Judah's line, when you trace it down, who does it end up producing? The Messiah. I think that right there shows us the way God spoke this to me and I want to speak it to you. If you put focus on praising God and your relationship with God as Leah did, guess what? You're going to see Jesus work in your marriage too. If you focus on praising God, it might be on down the line, it might be years, but you're going to see Jesus show up in a mighty way. Make your relationship with Jesus the most important relationship in your life. I beg you today, do that. And anytime I tell you to do something, I want to tell you how to do it. You know how to make Jesus the most important relationship in your life? You love him above all else. That's all Jesus asks. We complicate things by making all these rules and regulations that people are supposed to follow as a Christian. But here's what Jesus said, love me and love others. You've got to love him in order to love others. Jesus, he invites every person, no matter what we've done, no matter what we're doing, he invites us to come into a relationship with him and to love him. Because he loves you. See, this was not possible. Those of us that know the gospel know that this was not possible because of our sin nature. Because we are so messed up. Because we have done so many things that are wrong. But what God has chosen to do is he has chosen to send Jesus to die on the cross for our sins. So that that pathway could be opened up so that we could have a relationship with God our Father through Jesus Christ his Son and so that the Holy Spirit could live within us so that we can know God and have a relationship with him. And when Jesus was asked what the most important commandments are, he said simply this, love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. I don't know about you, but that sounds like put your relationship with God first and love others as you love yourself. All the commandments fall on these. That's what Jesus asked you to do. But in order to do that, you have to repent from your former way of living where you did not love God. You've got to repent from your former way of living where you did not follow God. Where you were not in a relationship with him. you got to admit that that was wrong. That your, what you did was wrong. The sins you have committed that you was wrong. And that you are a sinner in need of his grace. And what Jesus will do is he'll welcome you with open arms. Say, my dear child, I know. I know what you've done. I know what you've experienced. 
but I also want you to know I love you anyway. And I'm so thankful you are here. That's the love he has for us. That's the love he calls us to show to others. I just want everybody to stand to their feet. I want every head bowed and every eye closed.